So this is part of the uh, spotlight uh, sequence of talks. I'm going to talk about my experiences working with startups. Uh, I was at Netflix until the end of 2013. So I've been spent almost a year and uh, almost two years, a year and a half to two years now at Battery Ventures. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what that's been like in some of the companies I've worked with and how they use AWS. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, what is cloud native, what are the architecture patterns that, uh, that I'm seeing, and the, mic the migration to microservices and containers that's happened a lot over the last couple of years. To cover that, I, I have um, long presentations I give on that. I'm going to do a very uh, brief uh, summary of that. Then I'm going to talk about some um, scalable application architectures that uh, SaaS products that we have uh, in our portfolio, that, how they use AWS, some of the monitoring management tools that we have, um, uh, a, a use case, a, a case where I worked on some cost savings with one of our companies, and then a few companies that help us migrate to AWS. I'm expecting this to take um, much less than an hour, and then I'm going to go to Q&A for hope, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever we have left. So hopefully, you know, think up questions, and um, we'll run around with the microphone, and we'll just go to general Q&A and anything you want to discuss. So hopefully, there'll be plenty of time for that. Okay, so. What do I do nowadays? Um, I maintain relationships with cloud vendors. I go see my friends at Amazon, and uh, I get to know some of the other cloud vendors too pretty well. So that provides an interesting conduit. I can take all of the uh, problems and ideas and, and relationship building that our portfolio need and represent that in a more concentrated way into the cloud company. So that's, that's one piece. Obviously, what VC firms do, we're always looking at deals, and I'm, the technology due diligence on deals is an obvious part of what I do. So ask the awkward questions like, does that scale, and what language should you write it in, and give people sort of nods or disapproving tut-tuts if it doesn't sound good. Um, and then once we've, once we've acquired a stake in a company, they become a portfolio, and my job then is to try and maximize the return on that investment. So if the company is a SaaS company in particular, a lot of them are, then you know, let's see if we can make them scale better, run more efficiently, um, uh, run more, more high availability, keep, their, keep better customers, those kinds of things. So I spend a lot of time working typically as a consultant with the CTO. And that's the piece of the job that's closest to what I used to do at Netflix. I was the overall cloud architect at Netflix, and I worked across lots and lots of teams. And I'd pick up ideas from one team, share it with another team, and pick up ideas from outside and try to uh, work across a lot of uh, different sort of organizations. And this is sort of much more diverse than that, but it's a similar kind of experience. I also network with interesting people. You are all, by definition, now interesting people because you decided to come here today. Thank you. Um, happy to hear from anyone that was here. If you want to connect, you want to talk about a startup, or you want to, you know, you'd really like me to come and visit your company when I'm in town and do an internal talk. I do quite a lot of those. So I spend a lot of time trying to un trying to get very broad connections into the community and understand what the real problems are, what's really going on, and uh, provide that feedback back into uh, Battery Ventures. I also tinker with technologies. I've actually written more code in the last uh, two years than I ever wrote when I was at Netflix. I, I started my little Go project on GitHub. I have been having fun writing code in Go. And um, I, I've written a microservices simulator. I'm not going to talk about that today, but if you find Adrian Coe, my Twitter handle on GitHub, you can see um, this fairly strange piece of software that I've been messing around with. Um, I also do a lot of conferences, and um, you know, I do keynotes at conferences, but I also get on the program committee for conferences, and to the extent where I've actually led the program committee for a conference uh, last week, and I'm doing another one uh, in a year or so. So there's, um, you know, helping steer the subject matter at conferences is an interesting place to be. You see all of the interesting discussions, and you pick things. Uh, and then obviously I do lots of internal presentations at, at companies and conferences. So I'm going to sort of move on this th to kind of a, a good place to start. Let's start with Werner. All right. This is the um, fundamental sort of starting position from the ACM uh, interview with Werner in 2006 about how Amazon.com worked and how they did things. And it, th at, this, at that time, this was a completely radical way of approaching things, that the developers are on call, that you run in small teams and you build stuff in these small teams you deploy independently. And that was one of the pieces that Netflix tried to figure out and copy and internalize. And it's now, nine years later, 
Um, a lot of people are trying to do this. And this is kind of the driving thing for, for people. And, and it's part of this transition as people go from a project-based model. A lot of enterprises, you work on a project, and a typical kind of project is, let's spend the next nine months seeing if we can upgrade our SAP installation or something to the new version. Right? So you get through that, and then everyone spreads around and works on a whole bunch of different things. Um, and then you know, maybe five years later, they go through another upgrade on whatever that thing was. Um, the opposite approach is the product-based approach, where you own pieces of a product, and you own its evolution, and it's evolving constantly. So every piece of Netflix is changing all the time. Every piece of a lot of you know, people that work in that way, you, the developers own something. They're on call for it. They're changing it all the time. If it breaks, you call the developer, because they're the only ones that know what state it's actually in right now. And you can't pass, hand over the product to some, say, an operations team, because the handover would take too long, and you'd be doing it too, too frequently. Or you can't do a handoff to ops 10 times a day just because that's how often you're pushing code. It's not going to work. You have to own it yourself. Uh, that means that what used to be operations is building platforms to help automate things. And so it's still a, it's kind of development of platform rather than development of application. And that's really the split that is kind of the new way of working that we're seeing. So what's going on out, out there? I spend a lot of time at CIO summits and things like that talking to people. Um, I, actually, you, you saw Rob Anderson of Capital One this morning. I've spent quite a lot of time with Capital One over the last couple of years. And um, you know, what Rob's been doing has been consistently at the leading edge of, of taking a very large organization forward. Um, but what you tend to hear from the CIOs is we're trying to align IT with the business. We don't want to just be a cost center. We want to be part of the business flow. right? And that's a different way of thinking. They're also trying to develop products faster because they're getting overrun by startups and their competitors. So Capital One is going to be running ahead of the rest of the financial industry because they have figured out how to develop products so much faster than the traditional methods that are used in that space. Um, and then, the, as increasing level, people are worrying about breaches. We're having every, every week there's another few companies where we get, it gets disclosed that um, you know, they got uh, either information stolen or credit cards or whatever. So th this, is some of, this is not everything they're worried about, but these are some of the high-level things that they're worrying about that, uh, that are part of this new world. And what that actually leads to now is that the developer responsibilities have exchanged have increased and, and sort of added a few things. So if you're responsible for what's running in production, you're responsible for how quickly it gets to production. So that's faster or agile, um, agile with a lowercase a, right? rather than the, yes, I have to do scrums and run around and stand up on a bunch of things. Um, but how to go faster is what I mean by agile. And then lean, which means being efficient about how you do things, doing things in very small increments and measuring everything and getting very tight feedback loops and hypothesis-driven development. And then rugged, which is a term that you may not have heard before, but uh, it's come out of the, the DevOps movement trying to incorporate security into DevOps. So sometimes you hear it as sec DevOps or DevSecOps or something like that. But, but a better term for it is rugged, because what we're, not, we're not trying to build unbreakable systems, but we're trying to build systems that are much stronger and more rugged than they usually were. Because you know, a typical application a developer builds is like maybe an iPhone that isn't in a case. And you give it over to operations, first thing to do is drop it, and it breaks, right? So whatever it happens to be, it's standard analogy anyway. You want. So, you put, so if you make it more rugged, you put it in a case. And then you can, you, know, you can drop it down the stairs, and it still works, right? You could still drive over it and break it. Right? So there's a limit to how, how indestructible something is. But you want to make things that are actually rugged from a security point of view. You want to make sure you've done penetration testing as part of your build system, and you've, you've made sure your, your um, supply chain, all the components you built out of, your, your system out of don't have known vulnerabilities in them, which is a big problem. A lot of people don't know that you know, they just built this Java app, and it's got five different ways in it if you happen to know that you're running these old versions of these packages. So those kind of problems. So building a good supply chain and then uh, put it, you're doing the proper encryption, doing a lot of very careful key management, knowing how, what your root of trust is. These are all things that really become developer responsibilities. You can't take you know, a fragile old app and wrap it in a... In a um, in a, put it behind a firewall and hope that no one's going to get through that firewall anymore. But I, I have an image I use of, uh, I don't want to put it in here because of all the copyright stuff, but um, you know, Linus from Peanuts cartoon, um, you know, he's the guy that's sitting there holding his security blanket, 
And that's pretty much the image you have of you know, corporate IT. I've got my security blanket. Yeah, it's full of holes, and it doesn't really give me any more security, but it makes me feel better. And you can just sit there and suck your thumb and sort of hope that the world's going to be nice to you. Um, it doesn't work. You've got to build systems that are really inherently secure, that protect everything. And these have become developer concerns, whereas a few years ago, they weren't. So, I ran a conference a few weeks ago um, called Go to London, where we dove into these subjects in great detail. So if you want to hear more about that, the videos for that conference are actually up, up being published right now. So what we're trying to do, though, is be more agile. And that means getting around this loop. This is sort of the agile, lean, uh, high measurement, continuous delivery, all those buzzwords. But what I'm really going to do is talk about how you innovate, right? How do you figure out what it is you should be doing? And you, maybe you see some customer pain point. You know, the customers that visit your sign-up page, only 10% of them actually sign up. So you want to go figure out why you can fix, fix whatever's causing people to drop out. So that's a typical kind of thing. Then you want to do some analysis and model hypothesis and see what's, what's, um, what could possibly fix this. And you typically have to gather data that no one's looked at before. And that tends to be called big data nowadays. But this is one of the, one of the sort of uses for this which is you want to ask, answer a question very quickly that has never been asked before. Right? If you're asking the same question over and over every week, like what's your, what was last week's sales, yeah, that's a curated business intelligence report which has to be very accurate. Asking this one-time question is something we need an answer quickly. It doesn't need to be very accurate, but you've got to have some level of dependability in it. So that's where I think big data comes in in this continuous delivery space. Then you need to be able to plan the response just do it, share the plans, and that really comes down to corporate culture. And some companies have so much process in the way that they're spending far more on the people time in their process than they are on everything else. Right? You, I've seen cases where you, you, your delivery machine is maybe a 10 cent an hour AWS instance, but you're spending $100 an hour of people process time over the top of it to actually get it deployed. You know, you've got processes designed to deliver mainframe upgrades or, or new Oracle licenses and millions of dollars of stuff being used to deliver things that cost you $10 a month. And that, that's the insanity of a lot of the large enterprises. And they're trying to get away from that and make things self-service self and automatically provisioned and using cloud as a, as a big part of getting there. But that's a cultural change. Breaking down those, those processes is a difficult thing. And a lot of the time, that's actually the single hardest change. Changing culture is the hardest thing to do. The technology is the easy part. And then finally, you use cloud to deploy. You're deploying typically an incremental feature. You're doing automatic deploy. And you're launching it, whatever it was behind an A-B test, because it's a hypothesis. If we change the user interface flow in this way, it might make it better. Now, it turns out, if you have 100 ideas for, for things, a third of them will be bad ideas. A third of them will make no difference at all, and a third of them will be good ideas, just roughly. That's kind of, you could argue with the percentages, but that's typically the way it looks. But you don't know which third. So if you, if you only ever try the third that you think are going to be good, you'll find that only a third of them work. And you've missed the third that you didn't try that were, you were wrong on that are going to make a big difference. So you have to try lots of things, and you have to expect a very high failure rate because it's counterintuitive what will work. There are many cases where the thing that somebody just about managed to persuade somebody to stick in production just in case it was interesting turned out to be a huge win. And this thing that everyone labored over and thought was going to be hugely important turns out to be a net loss or just noise. Right? It happens all the time. It's very hard to predict it. But every time you get around this loop, what you're doing is you're learning and you're learning about your customers, the markets, and you can try different technologies here too. And the faster you go around it, the more you learn. So what you really want to be doing is going down this faster than your competitors, whoever you're competing with. You just have to be doing it faster than them. And up to some point, um, if you can get around this loop in a day or a few hours or something, there's not really much point in going faster than that. But it's certainly people have moved from annual software releases to, to quarterly, to monthly, to sort of bi-weekly or weekly, and now getting down to daily being a typical cadence. So if you've got an idea, you should better get it out that day, because the tooling supports that. Um, you're not just going around this loop in one direction. You're also bouncing around it in every possible way. So, how do you do that with a large organization? If you've got a small team, you can just work on a code base and get something done. But if you've got, say, 100 people working on a code base, you know, you're checking in code that's breaking everyone else's code, and, and everyone's stomping on each other's um, you know, 
objects and models and, and I.O. patterns and all those things. So what you want to do is separate it out. And this really isn't needed for small teams. I mean, if you're doing a startup and you're still pivoting, you're not quite sure what you're building, you know, Ruby on Rails is a great way to rapidly prototype something until you get it to work. The trouble is a bit later when you decide you want to have a million users and go global, it's not a great architecture. So at some point you have to have a transition. But um, starting with lots of little microservices may be too inflexible and not the right thing to do if you're just trying to stand up an idea. So there's a, there's a point at which it makes sense to, to use this. So my definition of this is, is a loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded contexts. And you know it's loosely coupled if you can update pieces of it independently. So everyone can have their own release cadence. You still have to coordinate occasionally when we want to break an interface or change something fundamental. But almost all the changes you make are behind a stable interface. Or you're just evolving forwards. You have a backward compatible interface. And the bounded context is an idea from Domain Driven Design, which came out a book from 10 years ago. Um, and it's, one of the, it's part of the whole object-oriented design methodology. So if you think about this, and you want to think, well, how hard is it to bring somebody on board if you've got the monolith and you need to know all about the monolith to make it work? That's a lot, that's a lot of work to get done. Right? You have to understand all the implications and all the pieces that you might be touching and how it might break everyone else. If you break it into individual pieces, then you have this service. It has maybe two or three consumers of the service, and it has four or five dependencies. That's your world. That is your bounded context, and you can iterate within that. The pieces beyond that boundary you have to vaguely know they're there, but you don't have to be intimately, you don't have a lot of intimate understanding of how the entire system works. So what you find here is that because there's less to know, typically you want to have a microservice be something that one engineer can hold in their head, like everything this service does, right? Um, that way, you know what state it's in, you can evolve it uh, very rapidly, and you can bring new developers on very quickly. And when it breaks, it has a very clean failure boundary, so you know this feature broke. It's very obvious what broke. And what you're trying to do is always change one thing at a time when you do that. Now, this is all speeding things up. So in the, in the old days, we had data center snowflakes, right? Individually configured machines that were individually, individually per, per, purchased from a different vendor probably every time with a different storage platform. And there are these machines. And after three years, you're pay, finished paying for them. And maybe you throw them away, or you just sit there for a while. But typically, you have a, they sit at the same IP address and have very well-known names and functions. So that's, that's the old world. Then we move to virtualization and cloud, where it takes minutes to deploy things, and it's perfectly reasonable to have them live for hours or weeks. Right? So that, uh, when we went to that mode, IP addresses start changing on you. You have the monitoring tools all got broken. We had to kind of go rebuild them. And you had new generations of tooling that could understand that machines are now ephemeral and come and go. Then we went to uh, container-based deployments with do something like Docker, which takes seconds to cut start up. And it's perfectly reasonable to run one for a few seconds and be done with it. And the, if you look at um, some of the, the monitoring tools, I think it was uh, New Relic did some monitoring of Docker. And they found the most common lifetime of a Docker container is one minute. And the second most common lifetime is zero minutes. Right? And these are development and test environments that are being fired up automatically and having huge numbers of tests run against them automatically. And once they're finished, they're shut down again. So you're time slicing your entire development infrastructure, which is probably you know, a pile of fairly large AWS instances, which auto scale down at night when all the tests go away. And, the, and, and you know, in the morning, they scale back up again as you throw more tests into them. And that sort of environment becomes a very powerful way to save a huge amount of money. Because previously, all your test machines would just be sitting there forever, almost completely idle all the time, right? Maybe you had a bit of automatic test running against them, but, but much less dynamic. And a lot of enterprises spend actually more on test de and development environments than they do on their production environments. You know, Netflix, it's the other way around, because of the scale of customers is so big. But in a lot of, a lot of environments, saving money in test and dev is a huge deal. So, What's the sort of limit here? Well, AWS Lambda that was announced a year ago, you now have containers that live for milliseconds. And they fire up and they run for, you know, you get charged by the 100 millisecond. And I'm, I'm sure this audience knows a bit about Lambda already. I like to tell people you get the first million requests a month for free, and the second million will cost you 20 cents. <laughs> so they're not only giving you 20 cents free a month. It sounds good to you get a lot free, um, but it is only 20 cents. 
But these, these are environments that live for seconds, and now your monitoring tools are going, I didn't even see that go by, right? I'm monitoring once a minute, these things don't exist. Your entire pipeline of, of batch-oriented processing could be effectively invisible to you. So that's, um, that's an interesting sort of movement. So what's happening here is the speed is increasingly in enabling these new microservice architectures. So a bit of reference reading on this. Um, the Lean Enterprise book really is a very detailed book into what's going on in enterprise, hypothesis-driven testing, all the things you need to know about that. Building Microservices is the best book out there right now on microservice environments. Uh, Sam Newman's done a lot, of, a lot of training classes on this too. And then the Domain Driven Design book if you're trying to figure out how to build boundaries around your microservices. So that's my kind of summary of where I've been, what I've been playing with for the last few years uh, in terms of sort of trying to talk about technology. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about the battery portfolio. This is part of our portfolio. This is the enterprise IT section of our portfolio, and the most recent addition we have is Big Panda, which is the logo I, I put between operations management and big data, because they straddle the two. Um, I'm also gonna talk a bit about some of our non-IT. We have some portfolio companies which are more consumer or, or business-oriented, but these are the ones which are the enterprise IT space. And a few of these are actually in the, um, let me see, Stratascale and Zerto and uh, Vivid Cortex are out in the expo here. You can go see them. And there was a big crush around Stratascale stand this morning because they were giving away helicopters. So that turns out to be helicopters other thing if you're trying to get people to turn up at your, your booth, it turns out. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of these and what, what I've been doing to help support them. And um, I'm going to start by looking at some SaaS architectures. So if some of you might be unfortunate enough to follow me on Twitter, um, and about once a week, there's this little tweet that says something like, Adrian had this bazillion number of followers this week or whatever it was. So I have like 20,000 followers or something. Um, but how many new followers, how many mentions? And this is, this is from Sumall, and it's a social network um, monitoring tool. They look at a bunch of different inputs from Twitter and Face Facebook and Instagram, and they summarize what's going on. But they have a very interesting architecture. In particular, um, if, you look at, if you're doing, they use Eureka, and they use Haskell. So if you want a Haskell client for Eureka, that's the, they've done the repo, they've open sourced that for you. So just to save you time in case you want to rewrite all your microservices in Haskell, go look at what they're doing. Um, their architecture, I'm not sure if you can read it, but they have Redshift, SQS, RDS, Kinesis, DynamoDB, and S3. Um, it's all running as a whole load of systems. They've got Glacier in there. It's pretty much a complete AWS architecture. Um, Two years ago, they actually were, were largely using, um, they, were, they were more on, uh, I think, on a, the, what's it called? There's a MongoDB as a service thing that, they, that Rackspace bought. Um, I forget which one it's called now. But anyway, they've been migrating mostly to AWS and moving off of um, at Rackspace. And that's part of that sort of trying to get the, the sort of using more features and also some cost reduction for the way they were using it. So that's, that's one company you can see. It's interesting. They're in New York, and if you're a Haskell developer in New York, you probably already know them because they already they run all the meetups and things. So that turns out to be the right strategy. If you want to be like hire the best developers in a particular locale, pick a language and run the meetup for it. Uh, and that also worked for Nitro. They've been running the, uh, the San Francisco Scala meetups, partly so they can hire the best Scala developers or, or pull people in. So this is a document management tool. Um, some of you have probably been using PCs over the last few years with Nitro instead of Adobe as your PDF viewer. That's there where they came from. So about two years ago, they said, OK, selling a piece of software you stick on your PC is interesting, but if we want to get move, move up in the world, we want to be doing document management. We want to build a centralized cloud-based service which supports you know, you can sign documents and all those kinds of things. So they've built a very interesting system. It's sort of state-of-the-art Scala, Spark, Kafka, all of these things. And, um, and they've done this transition from a, you know, a product, you know, shrink wrap product on a CD kind of software to uh, this uh, uh, pretty nice uh, SaaS platform. So another company that uh, you may have heard of is BlueJeans, uh, the video conferencing company. And they have a, it's kind of think of this as bi-directional real-time Netflix. It's way, way more difficult. And then the customers are enterprise customers, so they're much more demanding about the features and things like that. But you know, they obviously have many fewer customers. 
than, than something like Netflix, but it's still a difficult thing to go doing. What they built, though, is a software-based codec. Most of previous uh, video conferencing systems had dedicated hardware in a very specific video format, and they didn't interoperate well. What BlueJeans did was move that to a software-based codec, so they take all these different protocols, decode them, mash it together, and re-encode them for all the different streams. So that's, that's a neat trick. Um, it's a SaaS-based platform. It runs partly on their own equipment and partly on AWS. In particular, after you've done a video conference, um, the recording is then shared with everybody optionally, and that encoding pipeline is one of the things that they use AWS for auto scales to basically deal with whatever the, the, the backlog is. A very effective system. The other system they've got is basically a complete version of this entire system, but running on AWS. And this is used for events. Um, they did an event during the... Um, during a, a, a movie, um, what's it called? Movie conference, not conference. One of those movie show things where they, there's, there's, what's the one they do in, in, in Denver somewhere? No, no, Utah. Yeah, Sundance, that's the one. My brain fade today. All right, so yeah, the Sundance Festival had a thing where after showing the you know, premiere of a movie, they had a discussion of it, and they had thousands of people sign in to see this discussion. And the trick here is this is kind of like a Google Hangout on air, except instead of just being stuck on the YouTube version of it, you can become one of the participants. So anybody that's watching it on a, on a one-way stream can be promoted to be on a two-way stream. So you can use this for town hall meetings and things like that. So it's a scheduled event. They are all different sizes. It's one of the lumpiest workloads you can think of. So it's just the whole thing is fired up for two or three hours at a time on AWS GPU instances, and then it all shuts down again. So a great use for, for, of cloud for this kind of purpose. And they can locate them wherever they need to be for things. So that's a neat, neat trick. So this is some monitoring and management tools. So this is, again, SaaS-based. Um, Vivacortex, this is database monitoring, very from, built by one of the, the key people, Baron, Baron Schwartz, who... Um, is one of the MySQL gurus, and uh, he spent, you know, he was at Pocona, he left, he formed this company, and we invested in them a couple of years ago. So they have MySQL to start with, but then they've added Postgres, Mongo, Redis, and then it runs on RDS as well as, uh, on, as the uh, sort of built-in systems. And it runs as a complete SaaS-based product. You just load your agent. And this is also an interesting, because this is a total SaaS-based product, but it's all written in Go. So this is another example of um, sort of Go becoming an interesting language for developing these kinds of systems. And it typically tells you things you didn't know about, because it's looking at these systems, at these databases, at the network layer, and it's decoding the protocol, and it can see things that most tools can't see. Uh, definitely worth a look if you're, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong. I mean, biggest customer I think he has is really GitHub. Um, there's a few companies like that that are using this. Um, most recent investment we have is Big Panda. Um, if you've got your monitoring systems are generating tens of thousands of alerts at you, and you want to filter it down to 10 sort of real things that are happening and correlate them all together, that's what this does. It sits in the, there's a sort of, this is, they did this monitoring scape thing. So Big Panda sits up here. It's sort of similar to MoogSoft and Riemann, what it does. But it, the rest of the space are inputs. These are anything that generates an alert or an event or, a, or anything like that. You pull it in, and you do all the correlation. And it's, it sort of straddles the uh, market between big data and monitoring tools. So we announced this investment uh, a week or two ago. So there's a blog post, a bit more detail on it, uh, on the Battery Ventures website. So the architecture they use, um, it's an interesting one. It's got MongoDB in the back end. And then there's a whole lot of RabbitMQ um, things that sort of pump data through it, slowly because it's pulling things in, validating them, marshalling them, enriching them, and then doing this correlation grouping. So it's, it is, it's a really interesting big data pipeline. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time with them over the coming year or so, uh, um, you know, helping them develop their architecture. This is, this is the new one for me. Um, and where are they running AWS? So they've got a nicely distributed architecture production in West One and replication in West One, East One, and, and Europe. So they're spread out. If, the, you know, it's a nice, if, if there's an outage in one region, the last thing you want to do is have your monitoring go out at the same time. So you want to have monitoring stay running, particularly event, <laughs> event monitoring, because there's like the one time you absolutely need your event monitoring to work. So they've been pretty good at um, distributing things and uh, building a lot of, uh, of um, dynamic management into this. 
And of course, they integrate to CloudWatch. So anything, you, any, any alerts or any monitoring things that you've got in CloudWatch, you can pull those up and uh, go figure out what's going on. So you can see the typical integrations they have. They have, an open, you can, they have a generic integration, so you can integrate them to anything you like, but they're off-the-shelf ones. They have all these things. OK, so cost optimization. So you know, a lot of the time when you start off, your, your Amazon bill is so small you don't really care. Sort of if, if your Amazon bill is the same size as your coffee budget for your office, it's probably not a big issue, right? Um, but at some point, your AWS bill becomes you know, comparable to the cost of an engineer. You know, maybe sort of you've, you've got to the point where if I could halve my bill, I could hire another engineer. And I see that as kind of the threshold of pain. A lot of people get to that point and say, OK, we need to start tidying stuff up. And, and I have one, one company I was working with who had 118 instances, and there were 21 different types. And they had one of everything, pretty much. I mean, actually, a big chunk of them were Redshift, but you know, those were the ones that were, that were already sort of tidy. The rest of them were, were just all over the place. And rather than buy reservations of like one machine here, one machine there, the first thing to do is get rid of all the obsolete ones. Take, get, anything with a one in its name is obsolete. Right? They're very inefficient. If you move to a three or the C3 or M3, you're getting much more bang for the buck, and you'll, you'll just, you just need to get off those. Second step, as you do that, consolidate to a few instance families because your, your M3 small, M3 extra large, M3 8x large are all basically the same reservation so, you, so that you can scale up, you can slice your big boxes into lots of little boxes, and it's all part of that reservation. And then the fourth step, oh, and then you want to scale it, auto scale it and tune the, your biggest usage to sort of get it to be reasonably efficient. And then finally, by reservation. So don't do reservations just as a first step. Use, it's really the last step. Once you've got a, a sensibly organized baseline load in a, in a reasonably modern architecture, go and buy reservations for that. At the end of the day, pretty likely, you, you know, if, if you were starting at a reasonable level of, of spend, you've, got, you've saved enough money that you can go hire another engineer. So a couple more, and then we can go to questions. Um, with a couple of products that we have that help with data migration and disaster recovery. One of them is Delphix. So Delphix is a, a, an appliance that you typically deploy on-premise. It's, an, it's a VM image that gets deployed, and it runs as kind of a software appliance. You connect it to all your different databases, you know, Oracle or SQL Server or MongoDB or something, and it sucks the data out of them and stores it, and then it regenerates test environments. You typically need test databases in order to run on things. But you don't want to have real credit card numbers and real private information in those test databases. So the trick is that they filter it on the way through. They put in, the, they mangle, the, you know, they hash up the names, and they, they create something that is much safer to create. And then they, they dynamically create these test, Im test images for long enough to run things against. So that's, that's a, a nice system. And you can also use it for cloud migration. If you're doing test and dev in the cloud, which is one of the first use cases that enterprises do, you want to take your on-premise systems and create little versions of those um, environments as cloud images. So that's, that, uh, there's a URL at the top here that there's a, you know, a worked example of how that works. Okay? So I've got encrypted replication, and you've got audits and all this filtering and masking of data. Okay, so that's, that's one use case that I think is quite interesting in this transition. The other one is, is Zerto, who do disaster recovery. Um, and their booth's here, so you can go find a lot more about this. But they would take your entire environment running on site, typically a VMware-based environment, and then they provide you a disaster recovery version where they don't just move the data, they move the images, and they, you know, they do the sort of migration of everything. I mean, so this is typically focused on disaster recovery where you don't want to run your own DR site, but you want to have an AWS account, which you can use as your DR in case your data center goes down, you need to fail over an application. So that's their basic idea um, for doing that. Okay, so in summary, um, agility is driving this change to DevOps microservices. Uh, we're seeing new cloud-aware SaaS monitoring and analysis tools. I think there's some easy opportunities for cost optimization for a lot of startups as they start to get a little bit bigger. Um, there's a nice market. We're seeing so many enterprises here that there's a good market now for migration tools to AWS. And what I'm seeing across our portfolios, AWS really is the default choice. There's very, very marginal use of any of the other public clouds as a, to either run these SaaS products on or as a target for migration tools. So this, this is where the action is right now. 
Um, just to put this up, there's uh, related sessions. You can go see Vivid Cortex and Zerto. Complete your evaluations, and I'll go to Q&A, and we have about probably 20 minutes or so. So um, we'll just go from there.